be here all night, so I want to watch myself. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. Thankfully, we have no seating in the upper loft. In Hebrews chapter 1, we're looking at verse 3. To get the context, I want to read verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, in these last days has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, becoming, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the truth on the pages of scripture that guides us with understanding. And Father, we are, as we think upon the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth that you have revealed in your word about him, we are on holy ground. O oh Lord, I pray like Moses, we would bow our head. I pray like Elijah, we would cover our face. I pray, Lord, that we would be careful to recognize that these truths on the pages of Scripture are not here to help us to try to understand with completeness because to comprehend the one who is indescribable, Jesus Christ, is beyond our capacity in this life. And yet these descriptions, these truths are here on the pages of Scripture that we might first of all know and believe and that we might look with awe, amazement, and wonder at the very reality of the person of who Jesus Christ is. That we might have a sense of the greatness of the majesty and power that belongs to Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the second person of the triune Godhead. That we might, Father, not be caught or moved with heresies that are constantly circulating and, and, and surrounding us at all times, but that we might be led in the paths of truth and righteousness and honor you because we believe, thus saith the Lord. So Lord, guide us in our study tonight. We give our thanks to you in Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter one, verses one through four, indeed the first chapter, but especially verses one through four, is one of the grand Christological passages of the New Testament, meaning it's a, it's a passage that outlines the doctrine of who is Jesus Christ. Christological just means a study of Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, whose name is Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, John chapter one, verses one through three, the entire first chapter, all the way through verse 18, is another grand Christological passage that teaches us about who Jesus Christ is. Philippians chapter two, beginning in verse five, all the way down through verse 12, is another grand Christological passage that teaches us about who Jesus Christ is and what he did and where he is now. Colossians chapter one, beginning in verse 13. Moving all the way through, through verse 19, is another of the grand Christological passages. These are passages of scripture that reveal to us knowledge so wonderful, so true, and, and so very, very helpful, but they are truths that must be embraced by faith. You can't, by human reason, comprehend them. You must open up your heart and say, this is what God says, I believe it. 
And if you're willing to do that, believe what God has said about who he is, he'll open your heart to understand it a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Because God's pleased to do that. But make no mistake, the reason that heresy abounds and proliferates is because who God is is beyond our ability to comprehend. He's the incomprehensible one. He's the un undescribable, oh, that's incorrect grammar, indescribable, as weird as it sounds. You can't describe the greatness of the magnitude of who Jesus Christ is, who God the Father is, who God the Holy Spirit is. And so, God tells us in his word, you must receive it by faith and believe it. And to the believing heart, one day, we'll stand in his presence, face to face with Christ our Savior. And we'll have the joy and the privilege of entering into the glory of what the word of God says is true. And so we rejoice. We're looking at verse 3. There's some five statements just in verse 3. There's more statements in verse 1. There's more statements in verse 4. But we're looking at these statements in verse 3. Last week, we saw the statement that Jesus, the Son of God... By the way, do you know the first time Jesus' name comes up in the book of Hebrews... You have to make it all the way to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who is faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken of afterward. But Christ as a what? A son. Christ as a son. Come back now to chapter 1. Verse 2, in these last days, God has spoken to us by whom? His Son. His Son. Jesus Christ. That's of whom we speak. He is the brightness. Verse 3, number 1, the first expression in verse 3. Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. And remember we said the effulgence. You all now know what that word means, effulgence. You have this, play it in Scrabble. It's a wonderful word, effulgence. It's the outshining or the shining forth of the very glory of God. And the glory of God is his perfections, the sum of all the attributes of God. Jesus is the brightness of the glory of God. And this is a statement of deity. This, when you understand this statement and not comprehend it, just accept it for what it says. Believe it. When you understand this statement, Jesus is the brightness of his glory you have in your hand from the pages of Scripture, an unequivocal statement of the deity of Jesus Christ. You cannot be, as Arius the heretic said, of substance like the substance of God and be the brightness of the glory of God the Father. The two are impossible. Arius... In the 4th century, that's 300 A.D. for people like me, and forward, 300 to 400 A.D., Arius, the notorious heretic, said that if Jesus Christ is the only begotten of God, then there was a time that he did not exist. That's what Arius said. In contradiction to John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, are you ready for this? A couple statements. People who embrace error in our day, and there's plenty of cults that do, one of the first things that gets attacked is the deity of Jesus Christ, either his humanity or his deity. Uh, people who accept or promote error will say all kinds of true things, but they'll twist either his deity or they'll pervert his humanity. That's what they'll do. That's what they'll do. Arius perverted the deity of Jesus Christ 
by saying there was a time that Jesus Christ did not exist. Now, you ready for this? He used a song. They made up a song so that people would sing it. Now, you know what happened when people sang songs? It caught on. It just caught on. It was catchy. And people sang it. Arius said there was a time that he did not exist. Now, this is in contradiction to the scriptures. Anybody who knew their Bible would say, Micah 5, 2, whose goings forth have been of old from what? Everlasting. Everlasting. So to believe that there was a time that he did not exist is to contradict the scriptures. In the beginning was the word. The word. Jesus prayed, Father, I want you to give me the glory that I had with you before before I came, before time was. And, and Jesus existed in eternity together as the Son of God, with God the Father, with God the Holy Spirit. Wonderful, blessed truth. But heretics will twist that. And, you ready? There's nothing new under the sun. So they have to get around some of these well-known passages of, script, of Scripture. John 1, 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Do you know what Arius said in 300 A.D.? Well, the definite article is not there, so you could translate it, and the word was a God. Does that sound familiar? That's what every cult says today in 2022. And all along and in between. There's nothing new. It's old and it's tired. To this, God raised up Athanasius. Athanasius stood up and said, only begotten does not have to do with the coming of Jesus Christ into existence. It has to do with the relationship between God the Father and God the Son that they have shared for all eternity. Jesus is uniquely the Son of God. There is no other Son of God like Jesus Christ. Why? There are sons of God, are there not, according to the Scriptures? Are you a son of God? If you're a child of God... John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he right, the right, the authority to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. And if you believe on the name of Jesus Christ to the saving of your soul, you are placed as a son, a son. But that's S, lowercase s, and there's many sons of God, many. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Welcome to the family. It's a wonderful family, by the way. But there's only one Son of God. There's only one. That's what we mean by only begotten, unique. Why? Why? Because what we're going to see tonight in this next phrase, in verse 3, the express image of his person. Athanasius stood up and said that Jesus was not of like substance, but was, in fact, the very substance of God. Jesus is the same substance as God. In other words, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit share the exact same reality, 100%. That's what we have in this second statement. We're going to look at it, the express image of his person. Once again, God has given to us simple statements that say it all. Arius stood up and said, he's of like substance. Error, heresy, false. Why? Because Jesus is the express image of God. It's that simple. Isn't that easy? Even you can say that, can't you? If you believe it. If you don't believe it, you can't say it. No one can confess that Jesus Christ is Lord unless the Spirit of God has revealed it to him. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? Who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist, risen from the dead, a prophet, a mighty prophet. Um, they say all kinds. Of, well, who do you say that I am? It's Peter who said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the son of God. Blessed are you, Simon, because my father has revealed this to you. You didn't get this from flesh and blood. Human reasoning cannot comprehend. But the word of God says why? so that you may believe, you may believe, so that you may know and go forward. And by the way, have something to answer, have something to answer to those. Because the error, the denial of the truth about Jesus Christ proliferates down through the centuries, circles, and is 
promoted, promulgated, use any word you want, but the word of God cuts right straight through and says, thus saith the Lord, Jesus is the express image of God. Let's look at the phrase, first of all, the, the phrase, the express image of God. We have the words express image in our English Bible, and the express image comes from the Greek word from which we get our English word character. In the Greek, it's character. We get our word character. And uh, the word here, character, it speaks of that which is the exact representation left by the tool. Now, often, they would talk about when a tool, a carving tool of some sort, carved in the rock or the clay, the character was the, the tool. That was the character that would carve. Later on, the word was used to speak of that which was carved. The word character was used to speak of both the tool and that which was carved. And uh, a similar expression, idea of it for us today is once again, I use it, a uh, different word than tupos. Here we have character. But it's like, it's like a typewriter. You have the typewriter, and let's say you have the letter S. You hit the S on the board, and the old-fashioned typewriter would strike the paper. The S that did the striking was the character. Later on, the S on the paper was called the character. It was the exact representation. Exactly. Why? Because it was struck from the same. All right? The express image talks about the very character. The word is only, uh, not only, but it's used again in, in Hebrews chapter 11. Would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11? No, I'm sorry, don't go there. I was right the first time. This is the only time, I'm getting ahead of myself, don't worry, I'll get to Hebrews 11 in a minute. This is the only time the word is used in the New Testament, the word character, the exact representation. So I went to Webster's Dictionary to get a little bit of help. Webster's 1828 Dictionary, talking about the word character, says a mark made by cutting or engraving. Characters are literal as the letters of an alphabet. Numbers, they are literal. It is the mark or figure made by stamping or impression, as on a coin, when they would impress. Remember when the Lord Jesus Christ was asked whether or not he should pay the temple tax or pay tax? Remember when Jesus took the coin and he asked whose image is on it? It's a different word, but it conveys the same idea. When they told him, well, that's Caesar's image. It was the likeness of Caesar. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and render unto the Lord the things that belong to him. We were created in the image of God. Give your heart to God. That's what the Lord Jesus, same idea, same uh, 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 idea. But the Lord Jesus Christ here is not just the express image, that's not the totality of the phrase. Now the second part, the express image of his person. The word here for person means substance, the real being. Now that's where I want to go to Hebrews 11, please. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Because this word comes up again in Hebrews and a verse that we're very familiar with. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The word substance in our English Bible is the same word that we have in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, uh, the express image. Here, it's translated substance. Our faith is the reality of things hoped for. In other words, we hope for heaven. Can we see it with our human eyes? No, but it's real. Why? Because we believe in what God has said. And our faith, when people see a believer's faith, in what God has said in his word, then they see the substance of the reality. That's why when we live our faith in Jesus Christ, they see Christ in you. Now God manifests that by his spirit who dwells within. But the concept here is the substance, the very reality. Come back to Hebrews chapter one. Jesus is the express image. That is, he is the exact representation of the substance 
of God. That's the meaning of this phrase. Now, when we talk about the substance of God, this indeed is actually a little bit difficult for us. Here's where I opened up. We're on holy ground. Can we truly understand the substance of God? Not any more than what we read on the pages of Scripture. We need God's word to help us. For starters, the word of God says, Jesus said in John 4, 24, God is a spirit. And to us, in our way of understanding, a spirit has no substance. Well, that's not actually true. Now, I understand the sentiment because we're physical, flesh and blood, and we're in this three-dimensional world. And uh, if you walk towards the door and you don't open it, if you don't stop, you'll hurt yourself when you get there, right? The door's made out of substance, and you're made out of substance. Well, God, the Spirit, is made out of substance, but not the same like you and I. It's altogether different. But because God is a Spirit does not mean that he has no substance. We'll see that from the pages of Scripture tonight. It's just that it's very hard for us to comprehend it because it's beyond our realm of creation. You and I have been made mortal. We are human, and we are made flesh and blood. So substance has something that we readily identify. God's spiritual substance goes beyond that. But let's ask the question, what does the scriptures refer to? What do they mean when they're referring to the substance of God? Well, they are referring to the very nature, the very essence of who and what God is. Number one, God is a spirit. Jesus told us that. God is spirit. But get rid of your ideas from Hollywood or books that you've read. That doesn't mean God is some ghost floating around. We need to come back to the word of God and find out what the word of God tells us about the very substance and nature of who God is. God is spirit. Uh, first of all, God is eternal. God is eternal. He is the eternal God. Uh, we read in Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God is thy refuge. Now, you and I are not eternal, not in the sense of our physical existence. We've been condemned under sin to die. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to die for us, to deliver us from death. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. But we are in a physical realm. With God, there's no death. He's the perfect, eternal God holy, righteous, infinite, pure, true God. And so there's no sense of death. He's the eternal God. No beginning and no end. Remember what God said to the nation of Israel? You are my witnesses, saith the Lord. God said, you are my witnesses that you may know and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed neither shall there be after me. Now, that was a very interesting way of God telling us he's the only God, the only one, and his existence is eternal. Sometimes people think of a, a circle or a figure eight as uh, little symbols to help us to understand no beginning and no end. That's God, no beginning. You and I, linear. We had a day that we were born, and we have a day in which we will die. And so we're linear with a starting point and an ending point in this life. God is beyond that. He's the eternal God. This is what we mean when we're talking about his substance. He's the living God. He's alive. Let's go back to the Gospel of John chapter 1 quickly. He is the living God, not meaning he has life. No, he is life. It is his very nature and essence to be living. He's the living God. That's, it's hard to express these things. I'm limited by my, my mind and my vocabulary, God has no limits. He's beyond all these bounds. Notice here in John chapter 1, again, this is another mighty passage about who Jesus Christ is. And notice in verse 4, the word who is in the beginning, who is with God, who is God, verse 4, in him was life, life. Jesus is the living God. God the Father is the living God. The Holy Spirit is the living Spirit of God. And so where did we get our life? God breathed into Adam's nostrils and Adam became a living soul. We received human life from the divine one. God, he is the living God. What do we mean when we talk about the substance of God? Well, God's spirit, 
God's eternal. God is living. We think of his attributes. This is just a little bit of description to help us understand. But let's go to some of the descriptions on the pages of Scripture. Let's go, first of all, to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. We're talking about the substance of God because we want to get a little bit of an understanding from the pages of a scripture. What does it mean that Jesus is the express image? That is, he is the exact representation. He's the character of the substance of God. What we mean is he's very God of very God. He is the very same substance as God the Father. And by the way, so is the Holy Spirit of God too. Revelation chapter 4, here we have the Apostle John on the island of Patmos caught up, verse 1, into heaven, the dwelling place of God. After these things, John writes, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which, was, which must take place after this. Which must take place after this is a very important phrase. You need to underline it, highlight it. You need to make a note how important that phrase is. Look at chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, and verse 19. It's very important to see the outline that Jesus gave to this book of Revelation. Revelation 1.19, Jesus speaking says to John, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things, did you watch this wording now? The things which will take place after this. Three categories. The things which you have seen are in Revelation chapter 1. Jesus revealed himself to John. He appeared to John, the risen, glorified Lord Jesus Christ. And you have the description in verses 12 through 17. The second category is the things which are, present tense, John's life, the things which are happening right now. That's Revelation chapters 2 and 3, which are the seven churches, and it represents the church age. We're still in that particular time period. The things which are has not yet changed. How do you know? Let's go back to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1, we have the third saying of the Lord Jesus Christ at the very end of verse 1. I will show you things which must take place after this. That is, the things that are after the present tense in John's life, the things which are. The church age, the age of the dispensation of grace, which we are still a part of, will transition with the rapture when the church is called home. I think verse 1 is a beautiful picture of that. Just a picture, but John hears the trumpet sound and he hears the voice come up here. And everything changes. Notice verse 2, immediately I was what? In the spirit, because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It cannot in this body be in heaven. We need a glorious body fashioned like unto his body. All right. So John was transformed in this moment, not eternally, because he came back and was here on earth. But for his time in heaven, he was in the spirit, like a vision, if you will. And behold, a throne set in heaven. And please notice, one sat on the throne. If you have no substance, can you sit down? Well, I, to be honest with you, I can't really answer that question. But I know this. I can sit down because I have substance. And when I'm seated, sometimes it's, it's a relief. But it's here, a picture, it's a picture of the seating of the divine authority of the eternal God. He's in the place of supreme authority. He's seated, a king on his throne. That's John now sees God on his throne, seated. And he can only be seated on the throne because he has substance. He is the eternal, living spirit, God the Father. That's who we have here in chapter 4. Notice now the description. Verse 3, And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. The jasper is the color, and the sardius stone is more than just color, but here there's some kind of shape to it. What, what uniquely identifies a gemstone different than any other stone or rock, is a gemstone is always in some kind of a crystalline shape. 
because of the kind of bonds that they form. And different gemstones form different shapes, all different. A ruby, a diamond, they all have different crystalline structures, but they all form crystalline shapes. That's what one of the things that identifies them different from any other stone. Also, they bond together in purity. You may find them in another stone, but the gemstone is the pure, like a Think of like a, I said a ruby, but think of a sapphire. Think of an emerald. All these beautiful gemstones that God has created. They all have beautiful crystalline shape. That's, by the way, why a jeweler can cut them and you can get such a smooth surface that he can shape into all different kinds of shapes because it's crystalline. It's not like a rock. It's a gemstone. The point here in verse 3 is that as John is looking at God on the throne, he sees beautiful color to the very glory and essence of the substance of God, but he also sees beauty in design as well. And I can't go any further than that. I, 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 because I, am not, I have not seen what John saw, but by God's grace one day I will. And I look forward to that. But notice there's substance. John would not use this stone, the sardius stone, as a picture to help us unless there was some shape to the beauty of the very presence of God in all his glory. Color, shape, a sardius stone, and notice there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Glorious color of the overarching glory and beauty that surround what? the very person of who God is. And we know this is God the Father because in chapter 5 we'll be introduced to Jesus who will be entering the scene as the lamb that was slain. And he will come to him who sits on the throne. And so we have a picture here. By the way, if you're looking for the Holy Spirit, he's in verse 5. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And then we have this expression, seven lamps of fire which were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. I believe that's a sevenfold description of the perfections of God the Holy Spirit. Here's the triune God in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Let's go to uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. Now fasten your seatbelt. It's right there in your pew. As we go to Ezekiel chapter 1. Because Ezekiel is given a description not only of the presence of God's substance, but Ezekiel is given a description of this mighty angelic throne cart. That's what I get from it when I read it. Here in Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 4 and going all the way down and through to verse 28, the end of the chapter. Now let's look ahead. In verse 28, we see what? Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. Does that sound familiar? Did we hear about a rainbow around the throne of God in Revelation chapter 4? Ezekiel is getting a glimpse of the same vision as John. Now, there are different things that the Spirit of God is going to emphasize for Ezekiel than what God emphasized for the Apostle John. A little bit of a different emphasis. One of the things, as you read these chapters carefully, one of the things that you'll find out is that the viewpoint is different. John is looking straight on, whereas Ezekiel is looking up. And so there's a little bit of difference of what they see. And, and you know that. If you're on the right side of the mountain and I'm on the left side of the mountain, our description, though very similar, there'll be similarities because we're describing the same mountain, yet there'll be some differences because of our vantage point. There's some differences, but there's a lot of similarities. And Ezekiel is struck with what is below the firmament. John describes it as a sea of glass. And the sea of glass in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 is to Ezekiel, who's looking up, a great firmament. In either case, though, Ezekiel describes the wheels and the wheels inside of the wheels and the eyes and the wheels. Wow! Amazing description. Notice in verse 22, 
Ezekiel gets to the likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures. Now you read about the four living creatures in Revelation chapter 4, chapter 5, and in Revelation. Here, Ezekiel is seeing that. That firmament that was above the heads was the color of an awesome crystal, just like John said, a sea of crystal. And the throne is on top of this sea of crystal, stretched out, please notice, over their heads. You see, John, uh, Ezekiel is looking up at the scene from below, which is interesting. And under the firmament, we have a description now of the four living creatures. But I want you to pick it up now in verse 26. Ezekiel 1.26, above the firmament, over the heads, was the likeness of a throne, an appearance like a sapphire stone. And on the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Now this is not a physical man. I'll show you this in another passage. But here Ezekiel sees the shape. That's the shape that he sees and describes of a man high above it. Verse 27, And also from the appearance of his waist upward, I saw as it were the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. That is the fire was in it, around it, surrounding this beautiful picture and expression of the very substance of God. And from the appearance of his waist downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. So was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. What are we talking about? We're talking about the substance of the very person God. Now remember... Jesus is the Son of God, right? And he is the express image. That is, Jesus is the exact representation of the very substance of who God is. This is a tremendous statement of deity that we have in Hebrews chapter 1. A little more, let's go to Daniel. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. Now in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar's given a vision, Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar's given another vision, Daniel chapter 4. Uh, Belshazzar receives a vision of a hand writing on the wall, chapter 5. But then, chapter 7, 8, 9, all the way through to the end of the book, Daniel is the one who receives visions from the Lord. Now in the early chapters, Daniel interpreted all those visions. Daniel's the one who's gifted by God to bring the truth of the revelation of what God is giving by way of visions. But here in Daniel chapter 7, as through all the end of the book in different visions, Daniel is given a vision. And here in Daniel chapter 7, God is again giving Daniel the same information he's given in different visions to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, specifically chapter 2, but in a much different way to this believing prophet. The other vision was given to Nebuchadnezzar, an unbelieving, Gentile, wicked man, until he was brought low and humbled his heart, as we read in chapter 4. But here, Daniel, I want to pick it up in verse 9, writes of a vision. And what does he see? Verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place. All these thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days was seated. Did you see that again? God is able to be seated in all his glory. This is a tremendous picture of the sovereignty of God. In all his glory, he's seated in the highest position and station. Verse 9, his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Uh, those last two statements uh, his throne was a fiery flame, his wheels a burning fire. Those are similar statements to like he's in Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel gives a lot more description. Daniel just gives succinct little statements, but very similar. Notice in verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. In Revelation, we heard about thunderings and lightnings. Here Daniel sees it as a fiery stream coming forth from him. And notice, a thousand, thousand ministers to him, ministered to him, 
10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened, indicating judgment. This is judgment that's taking place. And we see in verses 13 and following that one like the Son of Man came to him, the Ancient of Days, who was seated on the throne. So here in verses 9 through 10, we have a description that Daniel is given this vision and he's seeing, I believe, God the Father on the throne. And while there's many more questions that I have about this passage than answers, what I have is a description of the substance of God. Now, should we fancifully make up our own ideas of what God is like? Be careful. We should come to the word of God. We should very humbly study what it says because these descriptions show us that God is indescribable with human words and yet here are some descriptions of the very essence of the substance of who God is. He's not some ethereal idea. He's not some floating around ghost. He's the living God. He's eternal and he's seated. And I'm fascinated here that uh, Daniel describes his hair. Do I think that God has hair like you and I have? No, I don't. But I think that in his appearance, God has just a glorious, beautiful expression of his beauty described here, his glory, in appearance like hair. That's like wool. In other words, it's beautiful. But the point is it's substantive, spiritually substantive, meaning it's spirit, but it has substance and reality to it. Well, these are just a few thoughts. We could look at more. But what I want to do is come back to Hebrews. And what I want us to see tonight is Jesus is declared to be, in the word of God, the express image of his person. Or Jesus Christ is the exact representation of the substance of God. Exact. Now, we could go to Colossians chapter 1. I don't have time. But in verse 15, we're told that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Invisible. Invisible because we don't see him. You and I don't see God. That doesn't mean he can't be seen. If we were called up to heaven by God's purpose and enablement, we would see God. And by the way, one day, that's our hope, isn't it? To see our living heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the eternal Son of God. But with these eyes, people, we don't see God. Where's God? Oh, he's there. He's there. Jesus Christ came to reveal him, did he not? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The brightness of the glory of God and the exact representation of the substance of God. Except for this. John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. Something amazing happened in the incarnation. Jesus, the exact representation of the substance of God, came in the flesh. And this means he veiled his deity with a robe of humanity. That's what Philippians chapter 2 teaches. Let's go there quickly. Philippians chapter 2. Jesus, who is the image of of the invisible God, we're told here in Philippians chapter 2 in verse 6 of Christ Jesus, he's the form. He's the form of God. Another way, different words of expressing the same truth, but what did he do? Verse 7, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of what? A bondservant. He came in the likeness as a servant, as a man. And so, he veiled his deity with his humanity. And so when we saw the Lord Jesus Christ, if you and I were there in the first century, would we see all that amber, fiery stream coming? No, we wouldn't. We saw a human, ordinary man. But this was no ordinary man. This was the Word who became flesh. This was the exact representation of the substance of God in human form. Don't forget it. Fully God and fully man. And so, for time, we'll close with just these two statements. Let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. And if you, if you followed me, if I didn't put you to sleep tonight, I hope I didn't. If you followed me, it might give a little bit of meaning 
substance to two statements we find here in the Gospel of John. Verse 45, I'm going to begin reading in verse 44, John chapter 12, verse 44 and 45, the conclusion of Jesus' earthly ministry before it became very private with his disciples. Jesus cried out, this is very public and loud, Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but him who sent me. Now, in order to send someone, you have to be different than that one. I don't send myself, not in the sense that's being spoken of here. I'm sent by someone. God the Father sent God the Son. Verse 45, And he who sees me sees him who sent me. If you see me, you see the Father. Because Jesus is the exact representation of the very substance of God in human form. But this is God in the flesh. Chapter 14, now verse 9. You know it well. This is not easy to comprehend. This takes faith to receive it and believe it. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said in verse 7 to his, to his disciples there in the upper room, If you had known me, you would have known whom? My Father. Because I'm the brightness of the glory of God, the express image of the very substance of God. This is Jesus. This is God in flesh. If you'd known me, you would have known the Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Why? Because Jesus is the Father? No, no. They are distinct, and yet they are the same substance. Very God, a very God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. A beautiful expression. Why? Jesus is God the Son who came in the flesh to reveal all that God wanted us to know and to bring forth all that God wanted us to have. And the only way that you can know and have the very gift of God is to believe in Jesus Christ, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Let's pray. Father in heaven, give us grace to comprehend these truths. Blessed they are, important they are, for we are surrounded by those who would deny the very deity of the person of Jesus Christ. But Lord, on the pages of scripture, you tell us who Christ is. And I pray that we will grow in faith and in our understanding and in being equipped to tell others who Jesus Christ is. We give you thanks in Jesus' name, amen.